Here of Tov, everybody. It's Thursday evening, June 30th, 2022. And it is Or Le Bet Tammuz. We're just transitioning from Rosh Chodesh Tammuz to um, Bet Tammuz. I'm Riva Muna. We're recording um, live from Tzfat. And um, tonight we are going to Bezot Hashem, be doing part three of the Nativot Shalom on um, Parashat Chukat. The Nativot Shalom is also known as the Slonimer Rebbe. And um, it's a very beautiful, very deep uh, Hasidut based on Kabbalah. And um, to be clear, part one um, was, it was not recorded to the Zoom. The Wi-Fi wasn't working in the Batnidash. So it was recorded to um, Malka Mare's phone. I think Hila is trying to get a copy of it. Part two was Tuesday in Rahul Bracha's space. Today we did Tammuz um, in the morning at the Cohen's house. So um, here we are. Now we're in part three of Chukat. So I'll just take a moment um, to get situated, to take a breath. To wish everybody a Chodesh Tov, the last um, few moments of Rosh Chodesh Tammuz. And uh, just take a moment to land and um, connect body and soul. So for those of you who want to follow along in the text, uh, we are in the first mimer, the first ma'amal, called Taharat Para Aduma, and it's teaching... Um, some of the energetic themes and ideas um, from um, okay, sorry, um, I had just something just popped up on the screen. Okay, um, I just want to make sure that it's still recording. Yeah. Okay, so um, we are in the paragraph beginning. The Z gum. Those of you who want to follow along with the text. Hi, Elush. So nice to see you. Okay, so we're in the Nativo Chalam. And here we go. Right, and, and he says, and this is also what Rashi wrote, um, brings down, quoting um, another holy master by the name of Rabbi Moshe Hadarshan. Shepara aduma hi kapara al ha egel. Okay, so he's giving us now this really beautiful, um, deep um, insight that the, the whole energetic map, um, the spiritual and physical, right? The, the spiritual energetic map of para aduma of the burning of this of this red hefer and the using of the ashes to metahir or to purify others, while simultaneously the preparation that the Kohen um, goes through to prepare the para aduma puts him, um, oddly enough, into a state of of tum'ah, right, of spiritual um, blockage from the light. And yet in that same preparation, once the whole process is done and the ashes are prepared, it becomes um, a healing remedy for those who are already in a state of tum'ah or spiritual fragmentation or um, um, blockage or disconnection to be able to come back in. So it, it ha, it's holding that paradox. And here he uses the word that it's a kapara, right? So he could have used a lot of words. He could have said it's a tikkun, that it's a fixing, right? Somehow para aduma fixes the ma'aseha egel, the, the golden calf. And to be sure, of course, um, that that is what he's implying here, right? But he specifically uses this word kapara. So kapara is um, right, a famous example that we have of, first of all, you'll notice just the word kapara itself. Um, if you would change the vowels, it would look like ke or like 
a para, right? Um, a cow, a, a female cow. There's already something energetically there, um, right? Hinting and, and the, these energetic connections and the switch out, right? Um, but the word kapara we use to imply that um, if one person is experiencing spiritual or one entity is experiencing spiritual blockage or spiritual disconnection, then we mean like the flow of the or ain't self of the infinite night is infinite light, sorry, is blocked or is stuck, right? Um, or is like um, parts are not accessible. So there's something called kapara. And a kapara, for example, a very famous example of a kapara is, of course, on Yom Kippur, right? And the two goats. And um, one, right, one goat kind of absorbs, we call that in English, this term, a scapegoat, right? One goat somehow is able to take upon itself then have it put upon it all of the negative energy that's been accumulated and, there, and thereby free a different person or a different party or a different entity, right? It's like, how does that work? How can one entity act almost like a spiritual vacuum cleaner, a spiritual magnet, draw out all of the negativity, take it upon itself and, and, um, and then free others. And, and you can hear that that's exactly what happens in the process of para aduma, because the Kohen, the priest, right, who prepares this, um, the burning of this, of the red heifer, of the para aduma, does seem to take on all of the negativity. How do we know? Because in the preparation of this remedy, the Kohen does become spiritually blocked, right? We call it spiritually impure, but it's really more accurate to say from the word Tum'ah, spiritually disconnected, um, cut off partially from flow, from the light temporarily, and yet simultaneously is preparing a remedy that when administered to other people will actually reconnect them, bring them back into a state of tahara, mm -hmm. of connection, of um, reconnection with flow, reconnection with the light, right? So how does that work? Okay. Tavo imo v'tikneach savat bena. Right, so it's saying here that somehow that the mother is able to do a fixing, the mother um, cow, right? That's going to be the para aduma, the red heifer, is able to fix the golden calf, which you can hear, right? Is the child, is the baby cow, right? So we're saying, what it, what's going on here? What is this spiritual map? Um, to the best of our ability, because again, we know that it's a chok, meaning it's it's one of the spiritual laws that is so profound and so eternal and so vast that our limited and finite um, minds and hearts and intuition and souls and bodies um, does, doesn't even have a vessel to be able to contain its depth. So we can only get little tastes and little hints, but even those are, are so deep. So what is this idea that the mother can redeem the child? If anybody who the mother is probably laughing now because <laughs> we kind of know that, please God, we do this all the time, right? I mean, when we're so affected, God forbid, by our children's suffering that on a certain level, we would gladly trade places with them if it would redeem them, right? But here he's, he's asking, so what is this? This is wondrous. This is one second. Okay. If if we if we want to if we want to say that preparing the red heifer, the para aduma, is a healing remedy for those who are in a state of tum'ah or spiritual blockage, spiritual disconnection. Right. Okay. We might, we could say, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Right. We're preparing a remedy. 
the, what is this word and this idea of kapara that it it takes the place it it undoes almost um and it and it, and it draws out all of the negativity that happened um, at the time of the golden calf and it and it, it allows almost the Kohen to, to keep drawing out that negativity. And remember that Aaron a Kohen himself was not willingly, right, but part of the making of the golden calf with very deep and very good intention. He was trying to stall. And so he was participating with them to create a peace path and to stall um, and hope and, and, and hope that by that time Moshe Rabbeinu would have come down with the Luchot, right? Um, so, but, but it did come through his hand and he himself is a Kohen. So there seems to be some deep connection here, right? And the ki gam chet ha'egel noveya be'ikau mipgam ha'yeshut. Right, so we're saying there, that there's, because there's something about um, what happened at the Chet Egel, what happened when with this deep misalignment with the golden calf, that it flowed from this place of um, being very attached to form, right? Being very attached to the form that we receive the light in, the stories that we receive the light in, that we want it, we're very attached to it coming through um, a particular person or a particular time, or um, right, a particular love, a particular job, a particular answer, right? And he's saying, and that attachment, that deep attachment that we had, that connection to God is going to look like this in the physical world and feel like this in the physical world, right? Um, and that that attachment to the form that the light is going to take, again, whether it's a, a particular shidduch, a particular soulmate, a particular answer, um, a particular outcome, right? It, th that itself was what enabled the other qualities of control, fear, anger, um, resentment, feeling rejected, feeling abandoned to kind of take root within us and allow for the kind of response that happened with the Egel Hazahav, right? A response of, um, I'm not safe. Hashem doesn't love me. Hashem didn't answer my prayers the way I wanted to. Hashem's not showing up for me. Maybe I'm bad. Maybe I'm unworthy. Maybe Hashem is not loving. Um, Maybe um, it's too late for me, um, right? All of those different responses that happen in our being, right? That, that, that kind of set the fertile soil for the type of response that the eagle has a have. Like, well, if those all those stories are true and all those beliefs are true, then um, I want to numb out. I want something to just take away the pain of that truth. I want to turn away. I want to run away. God abandoned me, so I'm going to abandon God. I feel abandoned, so I'm going to abandon self. Um, I'm going to move into self-sabotage because God doesn't love me, or I don't know how to feel safe in this world. And at, le at least I can feel some ease and comfort for the next few moments, right? That's the best that I could hope for in this um, world of darkness and suffering. And um, it's it, and what we might also even call it, God forbid, yeah, but it kind of is what it is, right? Is, is, is a slow step-by-step -step suicide. Chas v'shalom, right? But like sometimes people, God forbid, shalom da, right? Take their lives all in, in one, you know, the um, vatechad in, in one time, excuse me. That sometimes people go into what we call yeush, despair and so they're physically maybe still alive but spiritually give themselves over into yeush which is a slow death right it's a it's a slow piece by piece step by step blocking and turning away from light okay
Okay, so he says, Right? And he says, because the Pasuk is that, that it's with, with regards to this man, this person, Moshe, Lo Yadanu, we didn't know Ma Hayalo, what happened to him? And he's and he's with the emphasis on the word ma, on the word what. Hainu, that is to say, Shemosha Rabbeinu Hu Bivchinat Ma, that Moshe Rabbeinu himself is connected to this spiritual word ma. So the first thing we'll notice about this spiritual word, spiritual word ma is that it has the gematria or the um, numer numerological um, um, value of 45, which is the, we're going to notice is the same for the word adam, adam or human being, right? Ma is a mem and a he, 40 plus five. Adam is an olive, which is a one, a dalid, which is a four, and a mem, which is 40, right? So one, plus four plus 40 will give us 45. We're also just gonna notice that we have a name of Hashem that's connected to Tif Eret, to the heart energy center or the Sphira in the body. And that name of Hashem consists of 45 letters, right? Which is again, the gematria, the numeral numerological value of Ma, which means what? and means a dumb human being. What means that something has form? What is this, right? Chochma is koach ma, right? The power of ma, the power of isness, of something coming into isness, right? Of form, beginning the descent, right? From light into form. Okay, so he says, v'natnu ma. Right, and it's written, and um, and we were given ma, which is what, whatness, right? Ukmo shahaeda alav haTorah veHaish Moshe anu. Oh, so sorry, 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 sorry. Ukmo sheheida alav haTorah, and the Torah itself gives witness, bears witness and testimony to Moshe by saying. The Haish Moshe Anav Meod Mikol Ha Adam that Moshe was able to um, nullify ego self, right? To to a more than any other human being who ever lived, mm -hmm. right? So deeply make way for the flow of Hashem's light, for Hashem's will, for Hashem's vision, um, to be in service of Hashem's vision, both for the um, prat or the individual and for the klal or for the collective. And it says Moshe was able to do that, even knowing his human greatness and his human gifts and his deep, deep um, potential. And simultaneously at the same time was so able to surrender into the flow of what Hashem wants into the greater, the greatest um, wisdom vision, right? Without kicking and screaming, right? Being in a state of of hachna'a, of acquiescence, of flow, of trust, of emuna. Okay, so it says, "Ve'ish Moshe anav me'od mikol ha'adam asher al pnei ha'adama," and Moshe had this quality of true humbleness more than any other Adam, right? Which is again, the Gamatri of Ma, who, who that ever existed on the face of the earth. Right, Moshe knew how to make himself so porous, right? That even though he actually had a human physical form and body, he was able to completely let the light enter every part of his being with no block, with no resistance, with no fear, um, with no holding on to or attachment to who he had to be and how it had to come out and how um, it had to look and how it had to feel and, and how he had to understand it. 
totally, totally, totally letting the light completely flow into him and, and through him. And also, as we know, remember he has kaune or right beams of light coming um, off of his face after Har Sinai, after Mount Sinai. So much so that the holy masters teach us he had to cover his face because he could blind people with his light. It was a spiritual light, but it was manifested physically. In other words, he was so empty of attachment to self that he was literally like um, an especlaria meira. He was like a beautiful, right, crystal um, um, vase, right, or container. That so he, he, it's like he had form, but his form was was so freed of of attachment, right. Um, that he was he was literally a, just a vessel for Hashem's light on the level of especlaria meira, right? On the level of being in full um, resonance with Hashem's will and being just there to receive Hashem's vision and will and wisdom and light and and reflect that out into the world. Okay. Ulchen nikreta Torah al shmo. He says, and this is why the Torah is called Torah Moshe. There's no ego involved. It's not Torah Moshe, the human being. It's Torah Moshe because Moshe was the transmitter, right? Just literally um, the, the channel so that, so that we human beings who are not yet on that level and state of consciousness could receive from the source of all light and consciousness through a go-between, right? Through something that could speak both languages, the language of the most high, right? Um, um, the supernal, you know, being and source of wisdom and life and light and Moshe and, uh, and us human beings and Moshe, um, you know, and it's, an, and it's an interesting experience because I had the very, very great pleasure and great schut of um, translating for Rav Kenning, who um, was the, uh, is no longer in his body, but was the Breslover Rav in Svat for many, many years, Harav Alazar Mordechai, uh, Ben Harav Gedaliahu Aharon Kenning. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I had the great pleasure of translating for people who would come to visit him, who spoke English but didn't know Hebrew. And I had this experience of um, noticing both sides, noticing when he said something and I wanted to filter it through my own human mind and human understanding. And so it wasn't exactly true um, or exact, like I wanted to soften a little bit or I wanted to make it easier for them to understand, or right? Um, and to be a true translator is, you completely get your own self out of the way and you become extraordinarily sensitive to all the nuances of the person that you're um, receiving their message, right? And the message, you want to give it over as as ne'eman, as true to the original message as possible. Okay, so he says, so it's called Torah Moshe. Because Moshe was so ne'eman, he was so true to the to the to the Hashem's original me message without filtering it or distorting it at all through his ego self. Odd kadekach that he could write about himself that the man Moshe was was hum more humble than any other being because there it didn't it didn't ignite or trigger any human att attachment, even those words itself, like delight or shame or gava or arrogance or, um, right? It, it, he was just completely emptied of those attachments to form. And so he was able to receive and transmit. Torah Moshe, mipnei shehu haya b'madrega zu shel bitul hayeshut can we, so we kind of said this already. He says, and this is why it was able, the Torah was able to say 
right, that this man, Moshe, lo yadanu, right, we didn't know, we, we never experienced something like this before, ma hayalo, kol kulo bivchinat ma, right, his, his whole being was in this state of a spiritual state called ma, which is, it means literally what, right, what, what is this, I mean, in other words, what is this that a human form can have physicality, be homely, right, be physical, exist in the world of, of Asiya. So it actually takes up space, actually has form, it's human. It has all the human um, systems in the body, right? And at the same time, be completely emptied from attachment to form and attachment to any particular outcome or any particular way that the light um, would come in. It's beautiful. He says, so, so what, what allowed the space for the Egel has that have to happen, that at the time, oh, sorry, I'm so congested. <laughs> sorry, excuse me. <laughs> Where are, when we were in the Dor and Mibao, and to be clear, right, we as a whole nation right now are are in the Dor Mibar, because that was where we are in the Pauchiot, right, in the portion of the week, right? So when we were in those spaces, i.e. when we are in those spaces, right, we want even the spirituality, we, we were very attached to the form, right? We're very attached to particular outcomes, um, even though, though we're calling it spirituality, but maybe we have a dream. Maybe that dream is a particular soulmate or person. Maybe the dream is to live in a particular place or to have a certain job or to have a certain relationship or to leave that relationship or to fix that relationship or to have a certain healing or whatever it is, right? We're calling it spirituality, but really we're getting very attached to a particular outcome, right? And we're saying like, if Hashem, if you love me, so you'll answer my spiritual prayers. You'll answer my tefillah. You'll answer my hidwa to dut. And um, right, you'll answer the deepest yearnings and longings for. Because look, after all, what I'm yearning for is physical. Yeah, sure, but it's really spiritual. I'm yearning for a Shabbos table with Shefa. That's spiritual. I'm yearning for deep, deep love with my husband. That's spiritual, right? He's saying, but where we're slightly getting off is that we're making the form of the light more important than the connection to the light. We're getting so attached to even our spiritual dreams, right? It's a very high level. I mean, I mean, it's a lot to ask from a human being, right? We do get attached and, it, and let's take a moment to be compassionate upon ourselves that um, that's a very human response right, to get attached to physicality as it's manifesting our deepest spiritual yearnings and longings, but we're being invited to see if we can graduate out of that, which is so hard. At least I'm finding it hard and painful, but on the other side of that is a whole other level of dvekut, of, of um, intimacy, and um, connection and flow with Hashem, but we have to get from there to there. Not so easy. Okay. So he says, "The alze amru ki zeh ish Moshe lo yodanu ma hayalo kol kulo bivchinat ma." Ah, oh, okay. Sorry, we read this already. V'ratzu shegam haruchani oti hiye bad bevad im yeshut, right? And what we want when we're in this midbar state, in other words, we're growing consciousness, and we're in the forty days between the new revelation, the new light that we received on Shavuot morning, right? Ma'amad Sinai. 
And we're incubating that and gestating that just like Moshe Rabbeinu did. Remember, Moshe went up the mountain the next morning and he was on Hau Sinai for 40 days. So, and, and so 40 is always the number for gestation, like 40 weeks of pregnancy, 40 days and nights in Noah's Ark, in the Teva, right? Um, uh, there's so many more, 40 years in the Neva, right? 40 is always this idea of gestating and getting ready to birth something new, right? So we're, that's where we are right now in the middle of those 40 days. And, and, and part of what was happening was we received light on a new level on Shavuot morning. And we're trying to integrate that and, and move into allowing ourselves to become something new, which also means letting things shed, releasing, letting things die, right? Old parts of us die, old dreams of ours die, old stories die. And we're saying here that, you know, sometimes what are the hardest dreams to let go of? The spiritual, physical dreams, right? Because physical dreams, we understand, okay, I'll let go of needing a lot of money, let's say, right? Let's say, right? But when you take my dreams of my spiritual yearnings and longings that are going to show up in physical form, right? We said like a particular relationship or a particular job or a specific tikkun and healing with a specific person. And I get very attached to that's what I think that I came into this world to do. That's what I think God wants for me, right? And then if I'm, what happens if I'm asked to surrender even those things, but wait, and here's the catch, but not surrender it from a place of yeush or despair, I have the opposite. Surrender even my spiritual yearnings and longings from a deep place of trust, from a deep trust in the flow, from a deep desire to be so aligned with Hashem's highest vision and highest will. It's a tall order, right? It's a, it's, it's a tall order, but it's exactly where we are right now in our spiritual birthing and in our spiritual unfolding and in our growing um, new consciousness. This is where we are, right? So, and when we actually got invited into those places, right? We grabbed back onto the form, right? And then before she say, you understand, right? Some, right, remember, remembering again, Shivim Panim the Torah, right? 70 faces of Torah. In a very deep and profound way to learn of those 70 faces, sorry, excuse me again, <sighs> is to understand that on, on some level, we learn those 70 layers simultaneously, not either or, but both, right? Adding nuance, adding a different facet to a diamond. It's what it's one whole diamond and you hold it and you turn it this way and you get the light and you turn it that way and you get the light, right? So this idea of, of the shivim panim the Torah is that, okay, some, some, um, before shivim, some of our holy masters teach that the Egel Hazahav was really degraded and it was just an excuse to be able to feed the, the lowest and um, most fear driven, driven and animalistic desires that were already there, right? The desire for like, excuse me, right? But kind of like an orgy and gluttony and money and right, all those desires that anyway are there. And now that Moshe is not there, it was like used as an excuse to anyway feed the desires that had never been elevated. They, they were hidden maybe or underground or a little quieted that they had never actually been penetrated and elevated up to the light, right? So some Meforshim say that's what happened. But other Meforshims, I'm not going to say but, I'm going to say and, <laughs> and other Meforshim are saying that actually it was... We, we, we had been exposed to so much Abu Dazara in Mitzayim. And, and then we kind of transferred that attachment onto our attachment to Moshe Rabbeinu. 
right? And we, we were like kind of being weaned away from being attached to form by first leaving Abu Dazala, but then we got attached to Moshe's form. It's still form, right? And now it's not that we want to give into our basest and lowest desi desires. It's that we don't know how to serve Hashem in totally detaching from the form that the light is going to take. Even because we think that our spiritual dreams, even though that we want to see them manifest in form, is a good thing. And form is a good thing. We're not saying um, that we want to fly out of our body and just be in a shama without a goof. That those, that's, those are very Eastern teachings. That's not the vision of Torah, right? Torah is, is um, to make a dira betachtonim, right? Is to draw life force, draw the orin sof, draw the infinite light into material form. So that makes it even a little bit more confusing, right? But what we're saying is, can we be so sensitive to Hashem's movements in the most exquisite dance that Hashem goes this way, we go that way. And Hashem goes this way, we go that way. That we're following the flow of Hashkacha Pratis. That when we see that the light in a certain form is not opening, right? We, we let go and we follow the flow of where it goes next. That's very di different than disconnecting from despair, from Yehush and saying, we don't need the light. We're going to block the light. The light abandon us. We don't trust the light. That's not this experience. This experience is that if the light takes you somewhere and says, I need you now to let go of that form, even though your deepest spiritual dreams are invested in that form, I need you to trust me. And can you let go and keep dancing with me in the flow and see where it's going to go next, even though you don't know now and you don't see where this is leading. And it feels counterintuitive to have God ask you to let go of your deepest spiritual dreams. It's really deep stuff, huh? Does anybody have a, a question or a comment just until where we did right now? Like anything explained or? No? Okay, so we'll keep going. Okay. Vizehu Mashane Mausham, the Yikach et Hegel Asher Asu, the Yisrof Maesh, the Yitran Ad Asher Dak, the Yizar Alpne Hamayim. Now he's talking about what happened to the Egel Hazahav. Listen to this process. So they took the Egel, right? They took this golden calf, right? Each piece of this is so deep and so important, right? That they, that they had made. And they burned it in fire. And then they ground it. It wasn't enough. Listen to how... Each step of this process, right, of allowing the form to, to, to be burned away, and then it's not enough that it's burned away because it still has some form. Now it has to be ground back into dust. Why dust? Because dust is the first level, right, when light is, is becoming homely, is becoming physical, right? Adama. Right? It's to return something from its form, to dissolve the form, but it still has a tiny little bit of physicality left. What's the physicality? Dust and ashes. And that's how it goes back to its roots, right? To when, when light first went through a system and order of operations and took on more and more and more form, right? So this is Oh, these are really, really deep Torahs, right? That need so much tefillah, so much tefillah. Can we detach while still holding in love with Hashem, for Hashem, 
Can we detach from all the physical forms, even our spiritual dreams that, right, that actually have um, physical form? And what if those dreams never happen? And you see, Moshe Rabbeinu isn't teaching something that he doesn't know. Because remember that he was very attached to one particular spiritual dream that it should in, 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 this, in this physical realm. And of course, that was his dream of entering Eretz Yisrael 515 times, right? Ba'et Hanan. Which is also, by the way, the gematria, the numerical value of shira, right? 515, shin and yud and reish and he, right? So 515 times. So even Moshe Rabbeinu had an attachment to one last spiritual dream, but as it shows up in a physical form, in, in olam asiya. It doesn't mean that, God forbid, we're not saying that it's bad to have dreams, spiritual dreams that are connected. But we're saying when Hashem says, I need you to let that dream go now. Because I need you to trust me that it's either not the right dream for you or it's not the right time. Will you dochek the sha'a? Will you keep pushing and pushing and working against flow, against Hashem's vision, and, and keep asserting isness and form and self and insisting, I have to experience Hashem's love and light and goodness in this story, in this form, in this way, or it's going to shatter, God forbid, the whole structure of my belief and my amuna. Or can I let the fire through my dreams completely consume me? And it, to be clear, I'm, I'm in the middle of this right now. And I'm, I, I've, it's one of the most painful spiritual experiences I've ever had. It's one thing to let go of Goshmius dreams. It's another thing to let go of Ruchmius dreams and not in a state of despair, and not in a state of bitterness. It's a very tall order. Okay, and he says here, so the Egel Hazahav was burned, that means it was melted. And then it wasn't enough that it was melted, then it had to be ground into dust. Ad Asher, Dak vizal al pne hamai that it was such it was fine fine dust, and it was put onto the face of the water. Vayishak et pne Israel. Now, vayishak. Vayishak here means right. It was given to pne Israel to drink, right. Again, this was a homeopathic fixing and healing a little tricky, violent one, to be clear, to be sure. Um, yeah, you're familiar, right? So that this is what happened, that Moshe, right, with the, the, the egg El Hazahav was melted, it was ground down into gold dust, so it was, it's all its form was stripped of it. It was mixed with water. It, we may understand here that the water here is, the remez is a hint to Torah, because it often is water and Torah. But the word vayishak means it was given to them to drink. But it has two more meanings. It has the meaning of the word neshika, as in a kiss. Right? What, what, what happens in a kiss? The form is not what's important in the kiss. The form becomes a transmitter for spirit and spirit to meet even more, say the holy masters, than the lower zivug, right? This is called the upper zivug, the mouth, the kiss, and full 
physical union is actually called the lower zivug. We say we call it the higher zivug because it's breath meeting breath, which is more elevated in the level of soul touching soul. Less form, right? The other zivug is, is very form uh, filled, right? And then the other meaning of the word vaishak is from the word neshek, ammunition. Okay, so it has different ways that this remedy could go. I knew that is to say, he says, what got burned here, what got burned here was our attachment to form. Our stories, our spiritual dreams, our physical body. Again, it's very subtle. So I hope that I can give it over well. It's we're, again, we're not saying that the highest level of spirituality is to just fly out of your body and be a spirit and, and not care about form. We're saying something so much more subtle. Be in form, embrace form, draw God into every form. But if you're asked to surrender that particular form right now, be able to do that too. Be able to go back to the light and to the flow and follow Hashem where Hashem is moving within the form and Hashem's direction of where Hashem wants to enter the form or exit the form. Ooh, it's a lot. <laughs> Right. He's, and he's saying here, allow the, the fire of Kedusha, right, to, to, to enter and to, and to, I'm hearing it here because we're feminine and then because I'm needing gentleness right now, right, it, it can be a gentle fire also, it can be a warmth. It could be Hashem's warmth. It could be Hashem's holding, right? But gently and warmly saying, not now or not this way, or not what you thought. Can you let go, let go, shh, let go. Trust me, trust me, let go, let go. V'zehu inyan tavo imo v'tikaneach tzavat bina. And he says, and now we're getting closer to unpacking this spiritual mystery that the mother comes, the mother cow comes, right, and fixes the calf, right? In other words, the para aduma is there to fix the chet ha'egel. Sheha para hitikun l'chet ha'egel, right, that the, the, you know, one thing that you might just notice right away is that an egel is a baby cow. So maybe what we're talking about is a mochin de katnut, a very innocent and pure, but also very unsophisticated and, and immature levels of spiritual consciousness. And in those very new, very young, very um, immature levels of spiritual consciousness, when we're just starting out on the spiritual journey, to be sure there's a level of purity and to be moved and, and young, you know, youngness, right, youth and naivete and sweetness and vulnerability and purity, yes. But there's also another side and face to those energies, right, which are um, the same way that a child might be very, very attached to the parents in the beginning, right? Needing to be held every moment to the form of the parent. As we elevate and mature, we, we understand, and this is actually literally happens, even at the level of psychology, right? We call it object permanence and object impermanence, right? As a baby becomes a toddler and as a toddler becomes a young child, the child begins to understand that just because 
you can't see the mommy now, it doesn't mean the mommy isn't there. When a baby is a baby, even if you go like this, the baby thinks mommy's gone. That's why they love peekaboo. Mommy's back. Mommy's not here. Mommy's here. Mommy's not here. Mommy's here. It's right. It's endless um, hilarity around that because they don't understand object permanence, object impermanence. As we evolve and as we grow, we, right, we're able to understand I might be in my bedroom and mommy's in the kitchen. I don't see her, but she's still here, right? And therefore, I can become more and more able to uh, um, detach from the form of mommy and understand that mommy's love is still available, even if mommy is right now in the kitchen. I hope you're understanding where this is going spiritually. Sorry, one second. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam shehakol nihiya bilvaro. Right, so that's a um, a beautiful mashal or allegory. It's the same journey that we go through um, as we're growing um, into higher levels of da'at. Right, da'at we mean intimate, um, known, experiential dvekut and connection with light and source. So when we're just like the child, when it's young, is very attached to the physical form of mommy, right? But as it gets older, comes into awareness that mommy's love is still there, even if I don't see mommy. And then you know what? Even if mommy leaves the house, mommy's love is still accompanying me and I'm still being held by mommy, even though it's a less homely, it becomes more and more spiritual and less and less physical. But ironically, the love is growing. There's more love as the spiritual is as the physical is is being diminished. Much like we say, because remember that um, uh, tomorrow night, Friday night, um, and Shabbos day is the Rebbe. Um, Menachem Mendel, Ben Chana Levi Yitzchak, the Lubavitcher Rebbe's portal, right? Or um, your site, maybe, right? And and we say that, right, at Sadiq, um, in their mitato, right, at Sadiq, when their light leaves their vessel, they're actually more accessible because now there's no limit. Something that's infinite is infinite. When it's trapped and stuck, um, temporarily in a finite vessel, then it's available, but it's only available to some extent, right? Mostly on a finite level with little bits of infinite, right? When the soul gets freed from the body, this is pre Gaula, right? It's, it's different after Kriyatamitim. But, right? So we say that the light of the tzaddik is more accessible on his yurt site even than when he was alive. Because again, it's not being bound and limited by the attachment to the physical form. This is what we're talking about here. Okay. Ukashem Shaba Egil Neemaubi Sawafoto Baesh. Right, and he says, now something we're going to notice is that both cows are going through a similar journey of purification and becoming a remedy, right? So the egel hazahav, the golden calf, gets melted down and burned, and its mother, right, the red um, heifer, the red cow, is also going to go through be go, go through the same process, right, of being burned back to its um, most basic form, dust and ashes. Mikevan shehayeshut hi hakoach menaged beyoter likdusha. He says the reason is because kedusha is so spiritual, right? 
that, that Kedusha is functioning on the level of the infinite, right? Infinite light, infinite connection, infinite intimacy, right? Um, infinite ability to um, want light, to receive light, to shine out light, to generate light, right? That the thing that blocks Kedusha the most is, atta is, is, is attachment to, um, to form. Again, we work with inform. We work with inform to be sure, right? That our, our mission statement is to make a diraba tachtonim, mm -hmm. is to bring the light into the vessels. That's our whole mission statement, is to connect the light in the vessels. But when the light has outgrown the vessel, can you release the vessel? Right? When the light is, is greater than the vessel, we have to let that vessel go now. Perhaps get a bigger vessel, perhaps have a period of time where the light is gonna expand and expand and expand even more. But when the light has outgrown the vessel, can we detach and move into a new way of relationshiping with the light. The same way the child moves from having to nurse mommy every second to getting secure that mommy and I are connected even if mommy's in the kitchen and I'm in the bedroom. And even if mommy is out doing errands, right, even further. And even if mommy goes on a trip outside of the city, that our love is so deep and so wide that it's less and less dependent on the form. Uh, let me just do a time check. Um, okay, okay, yeah, let's. Um, sorry, it's on 45. Okay, we're, we're good, we're okay. Okay, so we'll, we'll finish this piece, Bezat Hashem. So just to repeat, Mikevan sheha yeshut hi hakoach haminaged beyoter likdusha. Alken tzichim lisrof ulebaer zot baesh kodesh. Right, and there and therefore we're letting the fire of dvekut. Right, we're letting like the yearning and the longing for deeper connection and deeper dvekut and deeper intimacy, we're letting that fire burn away our attachment to a particular form, to a particular outcome. That the story has to come out in a certain way if we're gonna maintain closeness to Hashem. We allow Hashem to come in and burn away that at attachment so that actually there's more room and more space for more Kedusha and more Dvekut. The Alzen Emar, and on this it's it said, Zot Hukata Torah, this, right? This is a spiritual law of the Torah. This principle of para aduma, right? Of the red heifer. This is a spiritual, eternal, deep, um, unknowable, right, spiritual law. Shehi be'emet hukat kol ha Torah. So the Sloan Rebbe is saying, because in truth, para aduma, its principles and its preparation and its energetic maps is equal to the spiritual maps of the entire Torah. That's what the Sloan Rebbe is teaching when it says, Zot chukat hatora. Zot is this, the para aduma. This preparation, this process is equal to every other spiritual map that the Torah has given you and is giving you and will give you. If you, if you can get that right energetic fixing and healing of the para aduma, 
it's, it's contained within it is all the other spiritual maps and principles. Walt is this deep. Shehi be'emet hukat kol ha'toah, that it really mamash is holding the spiritual laws of the entire Torah. Sheken kol ha'toah be'hamitzvot, Tachlitam lahavi u lekalev Yehudi lahashem itbarach u lehit dabek bo itbarach, because the whole point of every mitzvah, of every piece of Torah, the point of all of it, is to bring every person close to Hashem, and and into dvekus, and into this the 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 deep the deepest deepest intimacy. It's been a long day <laughs> with the light, right? Saying that's the point of all of it. So if we're getting attached to what that looks like, what that feels like, right? We're missing the point. Get out of the way, right? That it's not about getting the stuff and getting the light in a particular form or story. It's about connecting to the light. By light here again, I think it's helpful because light is, is a beautiful term, but it's kind of up here. And maybe it helps us detach a little more from the particular forms and stories. If we say, for example, and I'm literally birthing this tonight as we speak. For example, right, if I have a particular attachment um, to love showing up in my life, in, law, in alignment with a particular dream of what that will look like and what that will feel like, right? And if I don't have that dream that I'm attached to and then therefore I don't have love or therefore I'm, maybe I'm not worthy or I didn't deserve love or Shem doesn't want to give me love, right? And if I can loosen my attachment to it having to be in a, to a very particular relationship or a particular tikkun or that it feels a certain way or it looks a certain way if I can loosen my attachment to that right he's saying then I'm actually making my vessel truly more available for love it's it's the paradox remember it's the paradox one of the paradoxes of the para aduma is that preparing this remedy makes me feel in tum'a, meaning more detached from Hashem, more blocked to the light, maybe more bitter, maybe more sad, maybe more upset with Hashem, maybe more upset with life. That's the tum'a in the preparing of the remedy. But ultimately, the remedy is actually used to bring me into a higher state of tahara, of openness and receptivity to true connection and true flow. Right, just saying they're reflective here, right? The, 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 these two cows are reflecting that the two journeys are reflective of one and everything is created equal and opposite. That's what we mean when we say everything has a front and a back, right? everything in the world with equal power. What we're saying here, right, is we're at an energetic crossroads. When we get to this energetic crossroads, we're being asked something very profound and it could lead us into the deepest depths, God forbid, of despair, of bitterness, right? Of um, resentment, Hashem, of loss, of grief. And it's okay if it does lead us to those places because we said the way out is you've got to go through the Tuma to come out the other side into the, the Tahara. So it's okay. To, to, to grieve and to mourn as we're shedding those desires and those yearnings and those dreams, right? But all the while knowing that if we choose to step into asking Hashem to help us shed 
and become something new, become a bigger vessel, perhaps with different visions and different shlichut, right? Different mission in the world and a, a different dreams, right? It's 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 allowing oneself also, like the Ekel Hazahav and like the Para Aduma, allowing oneself to die while you're still alive, right? And I mean die to the attachments and wait and see what comes on the other side, what tohar, right? What new levels of purity, what new levels of openness to the light come out from this experience. Okay, last three lines. And the Torah wisdom is allow the holy fire, allow the holy fire. Right, and he says, right, it's the last little piece. And remember, he says, what also gets thrown into the preparation, right, literally thrown, right, into the preparation of the um, healing remedy of Para Aduma is a piece of the um, Erez, right, the cedar Lebanon, because it's, it's so Yeshut, Right? It's such isness. It's so huge. It's so grand. It has such malchus. It has such um, yeshut, such presence. Right? We throw that into the mix, and we throw the hisop, right, the ezov, um, into the mix. Now, I didn't see this anywhere, but it is deeply um, speaking to my neshama that, right, um, ezov is with an olive here. It means hisop. Hisop. Right? It's an herb. And if you're curious, I, which I am, um, when you get off the, the line tonight, um, which I'm planning on doing, <laughs> please God, to, um, to Google, what are the healing um, remedy properties of hyssop, of, of Ezov? Because understand this is pr preparing a, um, a healing remedy, right? But something that I'm noticing here is that um, when learning Torah, if letters sound the same, like a ah and a, ah, an a ah of an aleph and an a ah of an ayin, um, you can switch them out, right? So if we switched out the aleph for an ayin, we get the word here, um, the ezov, right? To abandon, to leave behind, to let go. And the shani tolaat, right? This um, red dye that was made from like the blood of a little worm, like a little crustacean, um, which is again, kind of energetically um, returning to the worm state, right? To la atami, below Adam, right? Says, says David Amelech, who himself is called the red one, right? The Admoni, the red one. Right, to, to go through this, and I'm, I'm in it. I mean, I'm, I'm so deeply in it right now in this class, letting, um, it's, it's a very painful and it feels like fire. I feel like I'm in fire, to be, to be clear. Um, but I'm also beginning to, to sense the freedom um, on the other side, right, of um, the burning away of the attachments and the burning away of um, even some levels of dreams, to be clear, and the burning away of, um, uh, I want to also say here, right, that both Torah and psychology, right, deeply connect fire, the, the fires, right? We can call it like the fires of Gehinam, right? Chas but the, 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 the experience of the element of fire and burning has a lot to do with also um, busha of shame, right? Like when our face turns bright red, when we're embarrassed, right? So he's saying, allow the holy fire 
right? Allow the pain, allow the pain of whatever it is, whatever the situation is that we're being asked to step into against our will. This isn't the outcome that we wanted. This isn't the way we wanted to experience the birth. This isn't the way that we wanted to grow. This isn't what we thought it would feel like. This isn't what we thought it should feel like. Knowing all of that, can we still step into the fire and and, and hold a space of um, willingness to have all of that burned away and come out on the other side as something more whole, as something that's in Tohar, right? That has more space for the light. Shadiska, um, would anybody like to, and it's just an invitation, of course there's no force, would anybody like to take um, any piece of any of this Torah that resonated with you, that touched you, that opened something within you, that um, birthed something, that called forth something, or even that touched you in a painful way and you'd like to turn it into a tefillah or a bracha for yourself and for all of us? I'm going to wait a moment just in case anybody is building up the courage. And if not, then it's also totally fine. Beautiful. So we'll sit with what we received. And may it be for the deepest healing on the individual level and on the collective level. Thank you for joining me. It's a really, a really special journey. Thank you. I'm going to stop the recording.